Good morning. It is so good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, visitors, if you're uh, joining us this morning, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, whether you're passing through or looking for a home congregation, uh, we're, we're just so glad to have you here. And we pray that, uh, or we ask that after our service, you stick around for a few minutes and uh, give us a quick opportunity to uh, get to know you. And if, you're, if you are traveling, uh, we pray that you have a safe uh, journey to your next destination. Uh, so you saw the video before uh, service started on the attendance cards. Uh, please make sure you fill one of those out. I think some of the pews still have the cards in the back of them. <clears throat> some of them don't, but cards are in the back uh, if you need to fill that out, or you can get on the uh, get online and fill it out there. But we'd like to have a we'd like to have a record of your attendance. So please make sure you do that <clears throat> before uh, service ends. Uh, there will be a grief share meeting today at 2 p.m. in the parlor. So if you participate in that, we will meet, they'll meet today at two o'clock in the parlor. Um, also, there's a reminder to the fellowship ministry uh, that there will be a brief meeting of the fellowship ministry this morning directly after services in the parlor. So if you're part of that ministry, when service ends, make your way to the parlor back over here and there'll be a, there'll be a quick meeting there. Um, also, uh, you may have seen the slide, so we are in teachers for Wednesday night. So if you are willing to teach or if you have a heart or desire to teach, uh, we're looking for kindergarten and first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. We're pretty much looking for them all on Wednesday night. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, please get with Angela. She can give you more information uh, for that. <clears throat> and the last thing I have is for the youth group next week, next Sunday, there is an area wide. So, so this Sunday night, there is no SNL this Sunday night. On Tuesday night, they have a movie night. So be sure you look at the messages that Grady's been sending out. Next Sunday, there is a, an area wide for the youth group, okay? But this one's a little different. It's a morning area wide, which is gonna be really cool and they're, they're gonna have different activities and stuff. So next Sunday for the area wide youth group, if you are going, make sure that you are at the building ready to go at 8.30 in the morning, okay? Kids, parents, 8.30 in the morning, make sure you're ready to go next Sunday for the area wide. It's in Tecumseh. Uh, you'll wanna bring a change of clothes because uh, they're gonna play volleyball and have some activities afterwards. Uh, lunch will be provided. Grady will send a message out <clears throat> later this week with a few more details as far as when we're, when we're gonna be getting back and stuff. So. Be sure you're looking out for that. But the main thing I want you to understand about the area wide next week, be here no later than 8.30 to leave, okay? That is all the announcements that I have this morning. Uh, at this time, if you'll please stand, we'll continue in service.
Good morning. Uh, we've come to the part of our, our, our service where we uh, participate in the communion, and I'm going to share just a couple of thoughts before we uh, go in prayer and do that. Uh, so Wednesday night, Kevin gave us a lesson about redemption and how Christ is our redeemer. And if you weren't here, sorry, you missed it. But uh, so it made me think back when I was a kid, we used to collect Coke bottles and they would have on them a uh, return for deposit. And uh, a lot of you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, but, but yeah, you could, you could get these glass Coke bottles and, and take them to the grocery store where you, where you got them or wherever, and they give you money for them. They give you a nickel or a dime, whatever, some, some, some meager amount. But, uh, but so we'd collect those up, and sometimes, sometimes we'd find some in, that people had thrown out their car window in a, in a ditch or something, and they'd be muddy and, and caked in dirt and, and, and just, just filthy. And, uh, and it made me think, you know, you know we're kind of like those bottles, you know. We, we, sin just kind of empties us out and just casts us into a ditch where we, where we get grimy and, and, and muddy and, and dirty and, and not use, useful for anything. But, uh, but then Jesus, he came, he came along and he redeems us. He redeemed us, he cleans us, and, and he, real, he cleans us through his blood and he refills us with his spirit. Um, this kind of goes on a verse uh, in the Bible, Ephesians 1, 7, says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So this redemption was accomplished through his crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what we're here to remember this morning. Um, his body was sacrificed for our sins, a perfect, perfect sacrifice, the only perfect sacrifice, and his blood was shed to cleanse us. Uh, so this is what we do here every week is how we remember that sacrifice. And at this time, we're going to offer prayer first for the, the bread, representative of the body, and then for the, the, the juice, which is representative of the blood. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just bow before you in all humility, uh, giving you praise and giving you thanks for what you've done for us, especially through Jesus, uh, the life he lived, the death he died, the crucifixion, and, and the, his pure, sinless body that he sacrificed for us uh, so that we can uh, live with you someday. Uh, may each of us partake of this in a manner that's uh, worthy and, and, uh, and always discerning, discerning of you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Time, let's continue in prayer. God, we just uh, continue to pray with pray to you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for the 
the blood that he shed for us, the blood that washes us clean of our sins, uh, but continually washes us clean as long as we remain connected to you. Uh, may we partake of this in a, in a, in a well-meaning manner and, and a, a manner that gives you honor and glory. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. We are thankful for the necessities of life that we have. We thank you for the opportunity we have today to give a portion of what you've blessed us with back to you. We ask, Father, that we always have the spirit of giving and these funds will be used the best way possible to spread the word and to bless those that need assistance at this time. We pray all these name things through the name of Jesus. Amen. Good to see everyone. How's everyone doing? Good? Great? I like that. What's that? Good. All right. Well, let's see what our lesson is. Oh, man. We had dinosaurs. Yeah. So you have a brontosaurus and a pterodactyl. Okay? Two, dip two different animals, but they don't eat the same thing. Right? Yeah. One eat, that's, that's a carnivore and herbivore. Yeah, eat leaves. So, you know what the cool thing is? We're both carnivore and herbivore. Did you know that? Yeah. So, oh, omnivore. Wow, we got some scientists over here. Nice. I like that. That's better. So, yeah. God made these animals. We know from last week that he made dinosaurs for a particular period of time for his own purpose, and they had a role in the life of the earth, okay? So we too, we are designed by God for a particular purpose. Now, how many of you like to eat salad every day? Okay, how many of you would eat a hamburger for every meal, every day. See? But look around. Not everybody answered. We don't, we don't all have that same desire. But God says there's one desire you should have. Listen. Listen. Hold on. Hold on. Shh. Hold on. One desire. God said there's one desire you should have for him. If we will desire God and love God and obey God, he will fulfill, look, are you looking at me or at the screen? Okay, look at me. I noticed. So, let's focus on desiring God because then he will fulfill our desires. Okay? You understand that? So, who are we to desire the most? Excellent. 
Here you go, DJ. All right, so let's see who has not had the box in a while. Lydia? Lucy? So we're going to let Lucy have it. So, all right, now, let's stand quietly as we walk to Children's Bible Hour or back to our parents. I'm curious as to how many dinosaur devos Gene can come up with. <laughs> uh, this is our meet and greet time. It's a time to welcome people, make them feel uh, loved and, and embraced. Uh, we have a lot of new people here. I'm going to give you an assignment. Uh, find somebody you don't know and introduce yourself to them. Everybody stand and let's do that now.
from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Thank you. Morning, everybody. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we have a new screen behind me. Has anybody noticed that? Brighter, bigger, clearer, sharper. We had a lot of guys working on, this, on that this week, and I just want to express appreciation for every one of them. Uh, they put a lot of time in. It wasn't just the screen, it's the projector and getting the woodwork right and working everything out together, so I appreciate that, guys. But now, doesn't it make the side ones look kind of dingy? <laughs> like, before those looked great, and now we, we got to change those out, I think. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're talking about John. For a year and three months, I've been talking about John, and I've got to confess to you guys, I've had a hard time. I've got a mental issue almost every week with John, and, and let me tell you why. My cousin dated a guy named John, right? And he, like, she would bring him to, I don't know, like 4th of July, and when you met this guy, it'd be like this, hey man, my name's Kevin, and he'd go, hey, I'm John. John! Like, he had gone to some corporate meeting on how to make people remember your name, or read a book or something, and then my dad would walk up, Hey, my name's Garland. Hey, I'm John. John! Like he would really hammer it down. And so every time I tell you guys, okay, open up the book of John, in my head I'm going, John, every time. <laughs> and what's crazy is it worked. It worked. Because I can't, I can't remember the name of her ex-husband. But I remember John. You know, I know John. And they broke up, and I, I miss John. You know, I miss... <laughs> I miss having them around. So as we've been going through, this has been a little tough for me not to just kind of break out laughing every time we think about John. Um, uh, we're talking about life in his name, and this, this I'm going to close off this sermon series with this. John 20, 30, and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wrote this whole book uh, to convince people that Jesus is God's Son. He said, I wrote down all these signs so you could, you could read about them, you can hear about them, and see the evidence 
that Jesus is God's Son and believe in Him and trust Him and have life in Him. So as you read the Gospel of John, I mean, it's life against death, it's light against dark, it's evangelistic, it's meant to win souls. Uh, but we've been hearing from the man, John, now we're going to hear a little bit of the man. Mark 3.17 James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. John and his brother, the the author of this book and his brother, Jesus gave the name sons of thunder. Now, I asked one of my daughters this morning, I go, how would you describe thunder? And she said, well, it's it's a big boom from the sky, right? That's it. That's a pretty good description of, of the way Jesus saw John and James. They were loud. They were maybe brash. Sometimes maybe even scary. Uh, their attitude was not timidity. They weren't stepping back. They were stepping forward and letting themselves be known. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Luke 9. We'll get a little insight into these guys. Luke 9, we'll start in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's a pretty bold uh, statement to make there. Here's what was happening. Jesus knows that the cross is looming in his future. It says he sets his face towards Jerusalem. He's going to that city. And, but Jesus isn't like everyone else. Uh, the other Jewish people would not step foot in Samaria if they could help it. They despised the Samaritans. They looked down on them. Uh, and most, of, most Jewish people would go all the way around, miles out of their way, maybe even days travel out of their way to not have to go into Samaria. But Jesus, he just charges right through. They're coming up on this village, and he sends his guys ahead to to make preparations. And I'm assuming what that means is find a place to sleep, find some lodging, make sure there's food and water, make sure there's a place for me to be and be comfortable while we're there, and maybe even restock and reprovision for the rest of the journey. And it may have even meant... To let people know in that village, hey, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. He's the healer. If you've got any sick people, bring them out. You know, if you've got anybody that's just blind or, or can't walk or paralyzed, or bring them out because Jesus can take care of their problem. Maybe that was a part of it. But when he gets to the village, they don't want him there. They want no part of Jesus being there because he's a Jewish man going to Jerusalem. It all had to do with the static between the Israelites and the Samaritans. And the reason for that is because they were closely related, but not closely related enough. See, when the Israelites broke covenant with God, and broke covenant and kept breaking covenant, kept breaking covenant, God sent the Babylonians in to invade and hauled people off. They were t- t- a lot of the Israelites were hauled off into slavery and servitude. But a little remnant remained, and then the empire brought people from other areas of the world and put them there. So what they would do is switch people around. They didn't want people being comfortable in their own nation anymore and try to rebel, so they would just move folks around. Well, those people that they moved in, the Jewish people in them intermingled, intermarried, had kids. Those kids were the Samaritans, who thought of themselves in a certain way as still God's people But the Jewish people would not let them worship in Jerusalem, would not let them come to the temple, rejected them completely. So the Samaritans built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. Uh, They built their own temple and started making their own sacrifices. Uh, That would have been 4th or 5th century B.C. And then 100 years before Jesus was born, 
a bunch of Jewish people, an army invaded and destroyed that temple. They went on, up on the Mount Gerizim and just destroyed it. Uh, so there would have been a lot of friction in that time. Can you tell me the name of the guy, the, the general, who led his forces into Samaria to destroy that temple? His name was John. John. I'm serious. John Hyrcanus was, was that guy's name. They leveled their temple, but they kept offering sacrifices up on Mount Gerizim, thinking that God would hear them or accept them. So there was, there was just permanent animosity between the two, the two peoples. They never got along. They were never going to get along. But Jesus didn't see people that way. He's, he's coming on through, going to that village. They get rejected. And James and John are furious. Jesus, you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did. First of all, when Elijah called down fire from heaven, it came down and consumed a sacrifice, right? It was a holy thing, not a murder thing. Think about what those guys are saying. They're saying, Jesus, let us call down from heaven fire to, to incinerate those people. Give them an agonizing, horrific death. Pregnant moms, let the flames eat them. Young men and women, let them be burned up. Just let us destroy everything. Let, let everything just be destroyed. Even the animals, let them die. That's pretty horrific, isn't it? I don't know if they were thinking it through. I don't know if they were just being the sons of thunder and, and speaking without thinking. But what they were asking was a horrible, ugly thing. And that was the desire of their heart. They saw, first of all, they were the Samaritans that they didn't like anyway. But they also saw Jesus being disrespected. They saw their rabbi, they saw the healer, the great physician, being dishonored and disrespected. And they were filled with righteous indignation and wanted to murder people over it. Anybody ever been there? That's not the best side of us when we start choosing wrath over mercy sometimes we show our ugly side when we do that and james and john were, were putting it on full display and jesus wasn't having it at all keep reading there in in, <clears throat> in luke 9 look in verse 54 his disciples james and john saw it they said lord do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them they wanted to them a modern day sodom and gomorrah they wanted that place to be smoke ashes they wanted everybody who walked by that village and to say this is what happens to somebody who disrespects jesus of nazareth that's what they wanted but look in verse 55 but he turned and rebuked them they went on to another village he rebuked them and some translations say you do not know the, the spirit, the, I'm sorry, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They went on to another village. I think that's pretty handy. Look, look at that. Jesus, they won't let you in. Let us kill them. Let us burn them up. And Jesus says, you know, but there's another village right over there. We can just go around and go to that village. Avoiding almost like a mini genocide and just go somewhere else. But the poignant thing is, he says, you don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save men's lives. Not to destroy, but to save. And sometimes we get all caught up in the destroy part. We forget the save part. Jesus rebuked John. I don't know, it, that's a pretty little, little statement there. The rebuke part, I don't know if he told them just to turn around and shut your mouths. I don't know, but I imagine it was pretty quick and pretty harsh. He said, you don't know what you're about. But John took that rebuke, and it didn't make him leave Jesus' side. Nowadays, we get some rebuke from somebody, and it seems like that our answer is just to disconnect that relationship entirely. That's not the way God's people should be. John took that rebuke, but he kept following Jesus. 
And he kept learning from Jesus. And he kept serving Jesus. And even after Jesus ascended back to heaven, John's life was dedicated to following Jesus, learning from Jesus, and serving Jesus. And through that process, Jesus changed who John was. He changed his heart. So by later in life, it seems like he's a completely different person. I'm going to read you these verses. These are all from 1 John. Verse 311, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 323, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus, uh, Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. And finally, 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This man, and when he was young, and, and I think we forget maybe just how young some of those disciples could be, he may have been a teenager when he was following Jesus. He was a young man. But he moved from becoming an instrument of wrath, desiring to be an instrument of wrath, desiring for, for death to come by his command. I think that's interesting too. He didn't ask Jesus, hey, do you want to call down fire from heaven? Think that'd be a cool idea? No. He, they wanted to do it. James and John, we want to call it down. But he moved from, from that anger and rage. He moved from being the son of thunder into becoming someone they call the apostle of love. And every bit of his thought and identity seems to be wrapped up in loving one another to the point where he says, if you don't love, you don't even know who God is. If your life is wrapped up in so much other stuff that is not love, where it could be anger or greed, uh, lust, pride, if you're wrapped up in that, you don't know God. You need to be wrapped up in love because God is love. If John can turn from a son of thunder to the apostle of love, what I love about that is there is hope for each and every one of us. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't come out of the baptistry perfect, right? Right? I think I kind of thought that was going to happen in the back of my mind. I thought maybe, oh, I'm cleansed of my sin, therefore I'm never going to mess up again. That's, that's crazy talk. When we walk with Jesus, and like John did, he walked with Jesus, followed Jesus, learned from Jesus, served Jesus, obeyed Jesus. If we do the same thing, then God is going to start polishing off those rough spots. He's going to start um, altering us from the inside out. He's going to change the way we think about people and things. He's going to alter the very core of who we are. Jesus said the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. In the same way, we're, we're not here to destroy. We're not here to be instruments of God's wrath. That's not your job or your calling. We're not here to destroy people with our anger. We're not here to use people with, by our greed. We're not here to objectify people with our lust. That's not what we're about. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost, and that's what you and I are about. And all of that hinges on love. Apostle Paul said Christ's love compelled him to do what he did. To sacrifice and to, to work and to endure shipwrecks and imprisonment and beating. Christ's love drove him to do that. He's, it's not, Paul didn't say, it's my love for God that drives me to do that. That doesn't work. Our, our love for God is imperfect, right? Inconstant. And it's definitely not our love for people or Paul's love for people. That's not what drove him because people aren't always lovable. And it wasn't people's love for him because... He wasn't always maybe lovable, and we're not always lovable. It's Christ's love within us 
that compels us to love other people and reach out to save. You're His. You belong to Him. You bear that family resemblance. Therefore, keep in mind, you're not here to destroy, but to save. It's easy to mix that up. It's easy to fall into those traps. It's easy to let the ugliest side of our nature show out. It's easy sometimes to forget what manner of spirit we are of. The spirit within you should guide you toward love and salvation. If we don't take his rebukes too hard, and God is going to rebuke you sometimes. Sometimes that that rebuke lays open your sin and shame in a way that shames you, but it's in a manner to make you turn and follow him. If we don't walk away when things get too hard, if we follow and learn and grow and serve, then our lives will be transformed beautifully. And God will diminish our pride and bring out His beauty in us. He'll strengthen our weak spots. He'll hush our complaining and train our voices to praise. And when He does that, our lives will be a testimony to our Savior's grace and love. Sometimes we can get stuck and stagnant. Sometimes when we stop following Him and start following us, we get trapped in a place uh, that is dangerous to be in. So think about this. If you're still carrying a grudge around for years, and you haven't let it go, and you haven't forgiven, what that should tell you is you stopped following Jesus, and you started following your own way. That transformational process is halted because you won't go any farther. And I'll tell you, it's hard. If you are still angry at someone, or if you're angry at everyone, that means maybe you've forgotten the manner of spirit that you're from. If your life is characterized by greed and anger and rage and and lust and and, uh, searching for power and you're filled with pride, you've forgotten the manner of spirit you're of. Remember that. And remember that Jesus came to save. And remember that Jesus loves you. Own that love. Accept that love. And let it be shown to other people. I want to close this morning with an invitation. Look, I know some of you guys are struggling and you may need some help. You may need the encouragement of your brothers and sisters. You may need prayers. I I, I forget to say this every week, but every week we have elders back in this prayer room right here waiting to pray with you. They want to help. Sometimes you need that to get over a hump or to get through a hard spot. Uh, That's what we're here for. Maybe you haven't made Christ your Savior in the first place. Maybe you haven't repented of your sins and put your faith in Him. Maybe you haven't put on Christ in baptism. If you haven't done that, there is nothing more important today than you doing that, finding salvation in Jesus, letting Him wash away your sins, make you His. If you need to do that or any of those things, Please come forward while we stand and sing.
Thank you so much for joining with us this morning as we worship and celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And always, we pray that you have found this time encouraging and uplifting to your heart and to your soul. So I challenge you as we depart this day and come in the days to come, think about what Kevin shared with us from his sermon. The things that Jesus said to James and John when they wanted to call fire down from heaven because the village didn't want to accept Jesus. And the love that we are given by God and how are we to live that out? So talk that with your family and your friends and your co-workers. Let, let's share the love of Christ with those around us. Let's bow and pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you, we adore you, dear Father, and we thank you for this new day, for this new opportunity to be gathered together in this fellowship, to be in your presence as your presence is within us. And Heavenly Father, as we have been challenged by Kevin's sermon to live out your love that you have displayed within us, Heavenly Father, help us to do that. Help us to walk in the manner that's pleasing and upright in your sight. And Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those who could not be here. We're mindful of those who are traveling. We pray that through the power of your spirit, he will guide them to their destination and bring them home safely. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those who are struggling, whether it be a physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual struggle. We pray through the power of your spirit that he will engage with them and, and grant them the strength to overcome, the endurance to see through the struggle and Heavenly Father, but most of all, comfort and peace and hope that will bring them through it walking with you. And we pray all this through Jesus Christ. Amen.